One Saturday, I received a call on my work phone, out of the blue, from a man who said he used to work for Atlas Copco and wondered how the company was these days. That mightn't sound very unusual until you find out that the caller, Steve Upson, began working for Atlas Diesel in 1940 and had a 41-year career with Atlas Copco. I was interested to know more about his career and his recollections of the company and its products, and he agreed that I could visit him in Carmarthenshire to ask him some questions. So Steve, thank you very much for allowing us to come here today to record this interview with you. Um, can you tell me when and how you came to be working for Atlas Copco, which was called Atlas Diesel at the time? Yes, it was Atlas Diesel. Um, I was evacuated during the war uh, to Hamel Hempstead and stayed with a family who had a brother, uh, a Mr Ems, um, who came to visit one day where, at the same time as my father and mother came to visit me. And uh, I heard them talking, Mr Ems asking what I would do when I leave. And my father said he'd just find me a job. So he said, how would I like to come to uh, his place? And following that, I actually started at Atlas Diesel at 14. So did you start as an apprentice from school? As an apprentice, mm -hmm. yes. And what, what was that like? What did you do as an apprentice? What did you learn? Very little, actually. <laughs> because the company itself had only just started at Stonebridge Park. They had been at King's Cross under railway arches and that's where they stored the compressors imported from Sweden and the tools and that was all being moved to uh, this new factory at Stonebridge Park when I joined. So King's Cross was a storage depot and then the new factory was set up at Stonebridge that's Park? That's right, yeah. Okay. Um, do you remember how big the company was? Were how many people may have worked there? Very few, because it was only sales and servicing at that time. Uh, but when they built this new factory at Stonebridge Park, it had a very large area. Part of it was for um, storage of uh, components, uh, and the rest of it, was eventually obviously used for manufacturing because they did gradually get machine tools in and start manufacturing. Do you remember what year that was that the factory was built in Stonebridge Park? Yes, uh, it was uh, when I started work in 1940. And what were they actually producing at Stonebridge Park? Uh, they weren't actually producing anything in the beginning, but gradually they uh, moved machine tools in and made parts, components. And uh, finally, uh, the P60 breaker. Mm -hmm. Do you know the P60? I don't know it. It was an early concrete breaker. Uh, they made some of those and a few rock drills uh, that we also made there and the MK35 compressor. But that didn't carry on for very long because there were other companies that were being opened where I assume that manufacture was cheaper than the UK. I, I imagine they started in the UK because it was cheaper than Stockholm. But then as the UK started and uh, presumably it was more expensive there, they went to India and opened up in India and other countries similar. And of course that was a lot cheaper production. So you mean they stopped producing in the UK again? Uh, they didn't do so much. They did carry on the producing, but uh, I'm not sure. It, I, it was after I actually left that they closed the factory down. Um, you very likely know that better than I do. Okay, but... That's probably in the 80s then. Okay. Mm. Um, yeah. Going back, um, back to the 40s again, what was it like working in London during the war? There wasn't very much at, at um, Hemel Hempstead, but there was a bomb which uh, landed in between uh, Atlas Copco and another factory next door. But it did. That, there was just that once that we had a... Mm -hmm. a, a bomb and, and it this... knocked down one wall of the factory. Okay. And this is in Stonebridge Park? I mean, or not this is at Stonebridge yeah. Park, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did the factory have an air raid shelter? The factory 
at Stonebridge Park had an underground air raid shelter. So when the, the sirens went off, all the employees went into the air raid oh, shelter? Yeah. Yes, in, that's the way it started. And then you've got long periods when the uh, siren go off and then nothing happened. You waited and waited until planes came over or something. And then the all clear would go. And so we'd be spending all that time down in the shelter and wasting. So what they did was to build a small little brick uh, lookout post on top of the office roof and someone would go up there when the siren went and if the plane they see the planes coming over they would press a button and everyone would go down the shoulder. Uh, <laughs> that worked quite well until one day I was up there on the roof and I could see these this aeroplane and all the aircraft shells around it. And I was so interested watching that and the flight plane flyer. And it came over and over and it reached there and then the bombs, I could hear the bombs coming down. So I dashed from this button. <laughs> and everyone who was in the workshop, of course, were really put out about it because... Uh, I should have done it long, long before, but uh, yes, during the war, I joined the army and we went to, um, first of all, to Bombay and then across India by train and then by boat down to Rangoon. On the way on the boat, the Americans warned the Japanese that they were going to drop the atom bomb on them unless they gave up but of course they didn't and so the first atom one was dropped while we were on the way across to Burma and then after two days they still hadn't uh, said anything so they dropped another one one on Hiroshima and one on Nagasaki and uh, that's when the Japanese gave in so by the time we got to Burma the Japanese were all in a compound just outside Rangoon by the main road and we would pass them while we were near in, in Rangoon or, or near and they were always around the gates there, the Japanese prisoners and uh, they were very good at um, colouring photographs. Lots of men had photographs of their wives and so on and the Japanese would take these and, and colour them. And they were very, very good at that. They looked, looked very nice. And for that, they got, got, gave them some sandwiches or something. Uh, uh, and I was curious hmm. to know who was working in the company during the war with a lot of the workforce fighting. Mr Stromberg. What did he do? He was the uh, manager for a time. For the UK? Yeah. OK. The most recent one was uh, Leonard Thorn, T H O R N. Mm -hmm. uh, that was some time ago. But, uh, oh, and Bengt Harkinson. Did you notice any differences between the Swedish workers or the British workers oh, and possibly the Belgian workers? In, if in any the came? beginning, the Swedish workers were very much more efficient. Mr. Bengt Harkinson, who was employed from Sweden, he spent about two or three months in an office drawing up this program of uh, production and when he'd finished it he presented it and it was, it was wonderful. It actually changed the company completely because before that they were trying to produce without any system, any real system. Uh, I know the foreman at that time, he wasn't very pleased with the change, but on the other hand, uh, he had to admit that it was a lot better system than we had before. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us the, the house story from the beginning about the Swedes coming over and staying? And OK. Uh, Atlas uh, also owned a house for visitors uh, and for managing directors who would stay in the UK for a, a time and this was situated somewhere northwest of London 
and I, I can't remember going into the house, but I do remember very often going to pick up someone from the house, and uh, usually it was uh, Leonard Thorne or one of the visiting managing directors. So. so can you tell me about quality control in the factory in those days, and if you've got any good examples? Um, in the beginning, there was no... Uh, quality control the people who were operating the machine just uh, had to make sure that they did it correctly but uh, then we did have a quality control controller and um, Stuart Knighton uh, became the quality control manager and would go around checking what people had done do you think it, you would have had the opportunity if you'd seen something that could have been improved upon? Would you have been able to put forward the idea and say, what if we try it this way? Was there that kind of culture in the company? No. I, I, I vaguely remember that I did at one time think of that, but uh, I don't think I even dared to put it forward. Did you travel with Atlas Copco to any other countries? I did visit India, Brazil. I have an idea that um, my... Travelling was not so much for essential for my work. The Swedish uh, managers would always take trips to England and other countries. Uh, possibly some of them were necessary, but I think there were very, very many when they were not necessary. And also their children used to be employed, so you'd get young people coming over and uh, they improve their English, but do very little as far as the employment was concerned, as work was concerned. And so I think that because that happened so much, when it came to me, they arranged for me to be able to go out and see, visit India and so on. So I didn't really need to, but uh, uh, it was quite a nice thing mm -hmm. to do. Did you visit factories then when you got there? Yes, I visited the Indian factory, but then that was just one day, and the rest of the time was just uh, having a look around. Do you remember which city you were in? Is it Bombay on this side? It could have been. It's in Pune yeah. now, but I don't think it would have been back then. Mumbai. Mumbai. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, they had a factory just north of Mumbai. And I went and visit that, but only one day, and the rest I was left to wander around. Uh, and how about the trip to Brazil? Where did you go there? Rio de Janeiro, uh, and just south of Rio de Janeiro. And there's a lovely coast on that uh, east coast of Brazil. Miles of beautiful beach. I remember lying on that beach and uh, a couple coming up to me and an older couple and saying, you ought to be careful because you'll get sunburn. And it was too late. I had sunburn on my back. So I think you mentioned that you were production manager at some point. Was that after the move to Hemel Hempstead? I would think it was after we moved to Hemel Hempstead, okay. yeah. And I think a lot of our listeners, particularly those based in Hemel Hempstead, would be quite interested to know what Hemel Hempstead was like at the time. But uh, Maylands Avenue and the industrial area were already, was yes, already there at the yes. time. The factory was right at the end of Maylands Avenue, close to where the offices, the Atlas Copco offices were, or Atlas Diesel offices in those days. I know that we used to have the offices in Viking House and then... In the 70s or 80s, we moved into the building we're in now on the corner of Swallowdale Lane, on the roundabout. On the corner of Swallowdale, mm -hmm. Lane, Swallowdale yeah. Lane, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. That's where the uh, offices were, the, sa the sales offices, but the manufacturing was just in Maylands Avenue, off there, the, okay. uh, the second factory from the end. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned also that... Um, you remember the acquisition of the Belgian company, Arpic Engineering, and yeah. uh, that was in 1956. Ah. Can you tell me what you remember about that time? Only that it uh, was when uh, Atlas Copco changed from Atlas Diesel to Atlas Copco, then at that time. 
uh, presumably because of that. Uh, yes, I think it was, yeah. yes. Am I right to assume that uh, the company must have been busy at that time doing a lot of reconstruction work in the UK? Yes, I suppose so. We also exported. England uh, exported to the Middle East and the Far East uh, Atlas Copco breakers and, uh, and goods and compressors. Uh, and that was going very, very well until the Egyptians were handed... I think this is the way that it worked, that Great Britain was moving out of a lot of countries like Egypt and leaving them to themselves, whereas before they'd been controlled by Great Britain. And when they moved out of Egypt, they realised that the Suez Canal, which they built, was of vital importance for exporting and uh, transport. And so they tried to keep that. And because of that, they went to war with Egypt for a very short time. I think after, uh, if I'm right, after a time, they realised that they hadn't really got any right to it. You know, it was part of Egypt, not, not British. And so the war finished. And then Egypt took over. But Atlas Copco, then, once the um, we moved out of Egypt and the, uh, we didn't have any control over the canal and also the Egyptians were not friendly, the transfer of tools to the Middle East and the Far East complete, almost completely stopped. And so the business went down considerably because of that. Do you think that Atlas Diesel or Atlas Copco was a name that people knew generally in those days? Yes. Uh, whether it was as much as nowadays, I don't know. But uh, uh, you ask most people. Uh, of course, they see compressors going around with Atlas Copco on them. You don't see so many nowadays as you did at one time. At one time, there were quite a lot. Yeah, the reason I ask is because my, my father-in-law, was he grew up in Kenya, and he was telling me how he knew Atlas Copco back in the 50s, 40s and 50s. In Kenya. Because there was a lot of advertising for Atlas Copco, but I expect uh -huh. maybe that was for the mining. You've got a figurine here, um, Arvos, Atlas Copco, it says on yeah. it, 1985. Hmm. What can you tell me about this? Uh, it's a 90, 1985, 100 years of Atlas Copco Arvos. The, the Arvos factory is in Sweden. And they produced this at that time. And uh, Masagatari is the man who apparently designed it. His name's on there. And if you look at it closely, it's a prospector. Uh, that's, that's what I make of it, you know. It, there's this thing on his back, a sieve and a, a trowel uh, on his back and walking along. So I, I think it's just a prospector. Well, I don't know. That would represent the company's mining history, I suppose. When you retired, what was your um, job title in the company then? It's very difficult to remember that because I'm not sure that I actually had a job title. My duties at the end were very, very little. You must have been one of their longest-serving employees in the UK. Oh, well, I'm sure, yeah. OK, are there any other memorable experiences of working for Atlas Diesel or Atlas Copco that you'd like to tell us about today? Christmas was a time when we had a, a company dinner. And in the beginning, it was quite a experience. Uh, the whole company would go to... Uh, a local restaurant and we'd have an evening there and it would be paid for by the company as well for the first few years but uh, then there were a change of management I'm not sure exactly who took over but after that we, although we had the Christmas meetings uh, and Christmas dinner it wasn't free we had to pay for it was it normal in those days for company to pay for the Christmas dinner for the employees? I don't know about other companies, but for Atlas Copco it was in the beginning. But um, 
I, I don't think very many companies would have done. Mm-hmm. Would you say it was a nice company to work for? Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. Why? Was it nice people or nice conditions for working? Nice people. All of the um, Swedish managers and employees were very, very nice and easy to get on with. Mm. It sounds all in all like you've got fond memories of the company. Yes, I think I enjoyed it quite well. So 41 years of working with Atlas Copco and a lot of interesting information there. I really appreciated the unique opportunity to learn more about the company where I've been working for nearly 20 years and I hope that you